Well, thank you for joining joining us uh, here at the National Institute for Newman Studies during uh, what really feels like an unprecedented time. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Tim O'Malley, Jenny Martin, and Matthew Levering, our speakers, for agreeing to help the symposium to come off um, again with really unforeseen circumstances during the last moment. Uh, we are encouraging questions this evening. We're going to try to do some of that after uh, Tim's talk. Uh, if you could. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please type a message in the chat section, and then afterwards, I'll try to call on each person one at a time so that we avoid uh, any unnecessary chaos. Um, I'm going to open up some prayer real quick, and then we'll turn uh, right to our presentation for this evening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Gracious God, we pray in a special way for those who are uh, vulnerable to this illness. We pray that you would protect them watch over them and comfort them. We do thank you for this time together. We pray that you'd uh, bless Tim, guide his talk, and open our ears to the wisdom that you have for us. We ask for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So we're very blessed this evening. Our speaker is Dr. Timothy O'Malley, who's Director of Education and Academic Director at the McGrath Institute in Notre Dame. Uh, Tim completed his doctorate at Boston College in Theology and education, where he focused on an Augustinian approach to liturgical formation. Uh, he's the author of several book, books, uh, most recently, Off the Hook, God, Love, Dating, and Marriage in a Hookup World, and uh, Lift Up Your Hearts, Liturgical Formation in the RCA. And I would encourage you to find both of those. Um, Dr. O'Malley lives in South Bend, where he's married and has two children. And uh, I guess I'm extending the welcome uh, and gratitude of all of us and turning the floor over to Dr. Tim O'Malley. Well, it, it's a joy to be with you this evening. Uh, I'm sorry that we're not together in person, but um, you know, uh, it really is a sort of strange time, a time that actually, will, as we'll see, will remind us uh, of some of the eschatological judgment in Newman's sermons. So uh, the, the title of the talk this evening, uh, of course, is related to Newman's sermons. But I'll, I'll call it in a more full title, The Healing of the Liturgical Imagination, The Sweet Rhetoric of John Henry Newman's Sermons. John Henry Newman's parochial and plain sermons have become integral to the evaluation of his identity as a Christian thinker. John F. Crosby and the personalism of Newman frequently turns to the sermons, arguing that Newman speaks heart to heart through the prose of the sermons, inviting the gathered congregation to think along with him through this rhetoric. In his two volumes on the Georgian genre of Newman's sermons, Victor J. Lambs perceives these sermons within the genre of the Georgic, providing advice for living the Christian life in modern English Christianity. Eamon Duffy further argues that Newman saw no real distinction between his theological work and preaching in his Anglican period, often using the pulpit as a location for theological speculation. The sermons are thus not peripheral, but integral to Newman's theological corpus. Yet among those who've turned to Newman's preaching, it is rare for such persons to invoke the context of patristic rhetoric as deeply influential upon Newman's preaching. Rhetoric, as recent scholars argued, within patristic preaching may be understood as a psychological reformation of the soul, leading the person toward a pursuit of wisdom. Patristic preaching was uniquely theological, concerned not only with the communication of theological themes or motifs, but the shaping of the Christian to both pursue and become the truth that one was contemplating. Such rhetoric included eliminating obstacles for understanding, often related to human sinfulness or contingency, and directly engaging with cultural assumptions that were hostile to the gospel, inviting the listener to dialectic thought, infusing the mind of the listener with the images of the scriptures, and offering concrete practices or spiritual exercises that the listener might perform to shape their memory, understanding, and will according to the saving medicine of divine revelation. 
This essay argues that Newman is taking up this philosophical approach to this preaching in the context of a modern, increasingly secularized English Christianity. Specifically, the liturgical sermons are ordered towards fostering a communal and real ascent to the narrative of salvation. This essay will proceed in the following steps. It will describe the psychological context of Newman's sermons, showing how two very different sermon cycles, including Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine, perform this psychological healing rhetoric. Second, the essay will show how integral liturgical knowing or knowing in a doxological mode is to his broader project as performed in a grammar of ascent. And third, the essay will focus on selected sermons of the parochial and plain sermons, really sermons no more from Advent and the beginning of Christmas. These sermons will move the reader and listener. Uh, you know, all these sermons were, of course, were for listeners, but were uh, published for readers through the liturgical cycle of the church, inviting the kind of psychological reflection that forms the liturgical sacramental imagination of the reader. And fourth and finally, it will conclude by describing three future directions related to Newman sermon studies, uh, liturgical theology proper, and pastoral responses to the problem of secularization. So to begin, psychological rhetoric in patristic preaching, and, and by the way, it, it's harder to say this, psychagogy isn't psychology, it's the leading out of the soul into truth, so psychagogy. The turn to more careful analysis of the purpose of rhetoric in preaching has been spurred by attention to the therapeutic art of ancient philosophy. Ancient philosophy, it's despite its modern predilection for theory, that is, do I exist, do you exist, does this podium exist that I'm holding this thing on, was not fundamentally concerned with questions related to epistemology or metaphysics for its own sake. Rather, ancient philosophy was ordered towards cultivating a way of life or a form of thinking that enabled the pursuit, at least in some instances, of virtue. The philosopher's pedagogy, as Julia E. Annas contends, was not meant to communicate answers to the one undergoing a philosophical education, a transference model that is often endemic in higher education. Instead, she writes, philosophy is not a source of pat answers or local cures, and people who think it is are misunderstanding its nature. Philosophy requires you to do the hard work yourself. The ancient therapeutic model presents philosophy as the answer you need for intellectual problems and dissatisfactions, but it is not presented as convenient or comforting. The aid it offers is austere. We'll see this, by the way, in Newman's sermons. The philosopher, therefore, was thus equally concerned with the formation of the person philosophizing. In his uh, infamous work, and I mean that in a positive sense, philosophy is a way of life, Pierre Hadot describes the nature of this formation as a series of spiritual exercises. The person engaging in philosophy would learn to research, investigate, read, listen, attend, perform exercises of self-mastery, as well as learning to be indifferent to that which is, or to that which one should be indifferent towards. The philosopher learned to meditate, thinking over the course of the day. He would memorize, allowing specific texts or maxims to enter into his imagination. And this person would engage in concrete practices that would enable this person to develop virtue, habits that ordered one to a way of life. Dialectic, often so annoying to my students and young readers of Plato as a whole, is itself part of this spiritual exercise. It forms the human person in a proper disposition for philosophy. As Hado writes, dialogue is only possible if the interlocutor has a real desire to dialogue. That is, if he truly wants to discover the truth, discover the good from the depths of his soul, and agrees to submit to the rational demands of the logos. The pursuit of truth required a conversion toward the good, and thus it was a spiritual activity never reducible to an academic exercise for its own sake. 
This theory of philosophy was important to the development of ancient rhetoric. Indeed, there were rhetoricians, as we see in Augustine's Confessions, who treated the art of speaking simply as technique, a way of manipulating persons and often avoiding the pursuit of truth. But in figures like Cicero, rhetoric was integrally linked to the act of philosophy. It was the mode by which the speaker invited and often conjoled the reluctant listener to take up a practice of philosophy to seek wisdom and the truth. The Augustinian scholar Paul Colbert refers to this kind of rhetoric as psychagogy, leading the soul out towards the truth. In his work, Augustine and the Cure of Souls, in which the first chapters deal with both with Greco-Roman philosophy and rhetoric, Colbert writes, psychagogy is a useful term for identifying specific practices and strategies employed by classical and late antique philosophers, poets, and rhetoricians. A working definition would be that psychagogy refers to those philosophically articulated traditions of therapy common in Hellenistic literature pertaining to how a mature person leads the less mature to perceive and internalize wisdom for themselves. These traditions stress that for therapeutic speech to be effective, it must be based on knowledge and persuade by adapting itself in specific ways, both to the psychic state of the recipient and to the particular occasion. Thus, as a contemporary investigatory category, psychagogy is a distinctive use of rhetoric for philosophic or, rhetor or religious ends, end quote. Christian literature as a whole, according to Colbert, was concerned with this art of psychagogy. But the homily in particular invited the ordinary Christian, no matter his or her education, to develop these dispositions of philosophical inquiry. Uh, we find this, by the way, especially in Augustine, in his early treatises on the philosophical life, in which uh, the hero is often an, uh, someone who's surprising. It's his son, or in uh, De Beata Vitae, it's his mother, Monica, who would ordinarily be excluded from philosophy, but as a Christian is capable of doing it. This way of appro approaching Christian preaching uh, has led to a renaissance in the analysis of patristic sermons. These sermons are not merely the communication of information available in a more complicated manner in other works, but instead pedagogical performances whereby the rhetor leads the assembly to take up practices uh, of memory, understanding, imagination, and will that lead one to perceive and appropriate the narrative of the scriptures. The act of exegesis within these sermons is part of the teaching, whereby the reader comes to think for him or herself through the exercises of the sermons. This psychological preaching, I just wanna give examples so you know what I'm talking about, it is present in a good deal of early Christian rhetoric. For the sake of time, I highlight but two. The first is Gregory of Nyssa's homilies on the Beatitudes. Nyssa begins the very first homily in this series of homilies by inviting the assembly to climb up to the mountain of the Lord where the Lord will descend, as Nyssa writes, who heals all illness and languor, who takes up our infirmities and bears our diseases. The therapeutic quality of the sermon is established and the Beatitudes themselves will become the spiritual exercises that enable the Christian to climb the mountain of the Lord, or rather to be lifted up on this mountain. The very first line of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, becomes an exercise in attuning oneself to the humility of the word made flesh. To become poor in spirit is to become like Christ. As Nyssa writes, what greater poverty is there for God than the form of a servant? What more humble for the king of creation than, than to share in our poor nature? And yet Nyssa notes that this pursuit of humility is no easy task for the Christian. He invites the gathered assembly or the reader of the homily as was more likely the case into the practice of contemplating one's own mortality in rather actually dreadful terms which might link to our own fears right now. Have you never gazed at the mysteries of our nature in a common burial ground? Skulls denuded of flesh, 
fearful and ugly to look at with their empty sockets. The young, according to Nyssa, have not contemplated this because of their foolishness. Instead, the young participate in the carnival of delights as actors upon a stage, unaware that they're destined that for the decomposition of the flesh. The first step in this poverty, therefore, which is really the poverty the word made flesh, is to look realistically at the pursuit of gold, of wealth, and fame. It's nothing more than the costumes of an actor. Nyssa is thus doing far more than explaining or even providing a tropological interpretation of the first beatitude. He's initiating the listener reader into a way of reading the scriptures and thus reading his or her own life. Uh, and of course, this continues throughout the entire beatitude sermons to the point where one has prepared to see God face to face. Augustine also practices this therapy of desire within his homilies. He teaches the assembly to read the scriptures not as some simple primitive text, but as integral to the formation of Christian memory. In his sermon 194 delivered on Christmas day, Augustine begins by instructing the assembly to assume a proper attitude towards the events of the day's feast. He writes, listen children of light, adopted into the kingdom of God, listen and hear what you know, reflect upon what you hear, love what you believe, proclaim what you love. Augustine is describing to the assembly the kind of dynamic knowing required on this feast, a dynamism evident to the assembly, uh, or dynamism evident in the exchange of divinity and humanity that the feast presents for contemplation. Indeed, Christmas is the wondrous exchange of divinity and humanity, and the Christian who celebrates it well should use the feast as a way of entering into divine life. The feast bestows images by which this exchange should, should unfold. Describing the praise of angels, Augustine exhorts, they then praise him suitably. We should praise him obediently. They are his messengers. We are his cattle. He has loaded their table in heaven. He has filled our manger on earth. He is the fair on their table because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He is the fodder in our manger because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In order that man, you see, might eat the bread of angels, the creator of angels became man. They praise him by living with him, we by believing in him. They by enjoying, we by seeking him, they by grasping him, we by inquiring, they by entering, we by knocking, end quote. Augustine is disposing his listener to the proper way of understanding the doctrine of the incarnation. It is not a doctrine that is immediately grasped, but necessitates a disposition to desire of seeking and of wonder. The very rhetorical speech Augustine employs, the use of parallels, incarnate the a proximity and distance of the listener to God. Yet the listener was made to contemplate, as Augustine sort of quotes from the scriptures, the day spring from on high, the glory of God made flesh. Until then, as the short sermon includes, adoring Christ in the flesh in the nativity becomes the way of preparing ourselves for the wondrous delight of the most praiseworthy God. This sermon is more than about communicating the theology of Christmas. It's an exercise in it intended to bestow to the listener the proper way of celebrating the feast. The whole Christmas cycle for Augustine does this by bestowing specific images and exercises. Uh, in other sermons, he encourages you to imagine yourself as a donkey or seeing yourself as pregnant, like Mary with the word. And that all of this begins to dispose the listener to the proper way of thinking about God in the first place. So second section, liturgical knowing in Newman. As a reader of the fathers, Newman would have been far better attuned to the rhetorical style of Nyssa and Augustine than many of us are. Still, Newman was not performing, as one could read the uh, Newman sermons, the same exact psychological exercises that Gregory and Augustine performed. Situated in Victorian England, responding to 
uh, contemporary philosophy to a tepid Christianity of his day, Newman's psychagogy took on a different character. His main concern, as we'll see, was related to upholding the reasonable nature of belief, a rationality that, that, did, that did not exclude de doxology, but necessitated it. The interrelationship between belief and worship, between knowledge and adoration, is evident in, in Newman's A Grammar of Ascent. In fact, the importance of a liturgical disposition in the act of making a real ascent and pursuing theological inquiry itself relative to a notional ascent is evident throughout the work. Here I rehearse what many of you know much better than myself, but looking more closely at the liturgical dimensions of Newman's thought. As I'll, I'll note, for Newman, doxology, that is a disposition of adoration, is integral to the act of belief, the making of an ascent. For Newman, one may offer a notional ascent to a dogma as a theological act, while one gives a real ascent to the very same dogma as an act of religion. As he writes, dogma is discerned, rested in, and appropriated as a reality by the religious imagination. It is held as a truth by the theological intellect. Newman seeks to understand how the religious imagination, if it's even possible, could offer a real ascent to a dogma such as belief in one God or the doctrine of the Trinity. After all, a real ascent must be concrete, grounded in an apprehension of reality. Yet who has seen God? Who has glimpsed the interior beatitude of the triune God? And if you raised your hand from afar, that's fine, because no one can see you right now because we're on Zoom. Newman provides a foundation for a real ascent in the dogma of belief in one God through the existence of a personal conscience. The conscience, as Newman presents it, related, relates to a personal relationship that each person has when considering God. He writes, conscience has a legitimate place among our mental acts, as really so as the action of memory, of reasoning, of imagination, or as the sense of the beautiful, that as there are objects which, when presented to the mind, cause it to feel grief, regret, joy, or desire, so there are things which excite in us appropriation or blame, and which we in consequence call right or wrong. This account of conscience is linked to what Newman will later refer to as natural religion. The human person is ordered toward a recognition of God, which is not reducible to simply affirming that such a God exists, but that human beings owe something to this God. Otherwise, why experience regret or joy? The conscience for Newman is therefore not reducible to a matter of interior moral judgment as it's often presented. It is instead that human capacity created by God that allows one to connect with God, to know God. It is the natural capacity of the human person, not necessarily influenced by divine revelation, uh, not necessarily influenced by divine revelation. Newman further writes about conscience, when men begin all their works with the thought of God, acting for his sake and to fulfill his will, when they ask his blessing on themselves in their life, pray to him for the objects they desire and see him in the event, whether it be according to their prayers or not, they will find everything that happens to tend to confirm them in the truth about him, who live in their imagination, varied unearthly as these truths may be. Then they are brought into his presence as that of a living person are, and are able to hold converse with him. Conscience thus allows the human person to dwell in a world where God is the realist of all realities. The, one more cult, the, one, the more one cultivates this conscience, the more one perceives the presence of God within the world. To make a real ascent to the presence of God requires that one live as if this God exists as a personal reality. Divine revelation mediated through the scriptures takes up this natural dimension of religiosity, not surpassing it, but bringing it to its fulfillment. Having established conscience as ordered to worshiping God, Newman turns explicitly to what functions as a kind of liturgical doctrine or the closest that one can get to it. Prosper of Aquitaine's Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi. The way that Newman treats this phrase is integral to his response to modern skepticism, <clears throat> the broad church tradition, and the Moravian Methodist. Newman moves from the unity of God, 
So this is, this is going to look worse than it is right now, but I just now am actually coughing because uh, I've been talking for a while. From the unity of God to the triunity of God within the dogmatic creeds of Christianity, he presents the dogma of the Trinity through the language of the Athanasian Creed, the Quiquinque uh, Volt. In presenting the dogma, he describes it as necessarily possessing a notional character. But Newman is interested in how a Christian might move from a notional ascent in what seems like abstract language to a real ascent of the doctrine. He analyzes the language of this creed, noting that each of the terms possesses a plain sense that may be understood apart from the knowledge of formal theological tradition relative to the Trinity. Simultaneously, Newman recognizes that no mind can possess clearly the eternal attributes of God, such as God as, as he quotes, an image of ineffable verity, insofar as such a notion is outside the direct experience of human nature, who, he does not write, but who have never experienced an ineffable verity. But Newman objects that this is ultimately a mistake of genre. The creed is not a collection of doctrines to be understood exclusively as a unity within a theological treatise. It is instead, he writes, a psalm or hymn of praise, of confession, and of profound self-prostrating homage, parallel to the canticles of the elect and the apocalypse. It appeals to the imagination quite as much to the intellect. The creed is thus not an expression ultimately or finally of some unexaminable mystery impenetrable to the human intellect. Rather, the creeds, as he writes, are enough to show that dogma may be taught in its fullness for the purposes of popular faith and devotion without directly insisting on the mysteriousness which is necessarily involved in the combined view of its separate propositions. It is within the context of this claim that Newman formally introduces the maxim, lex rondi, lex credendi. He employs the term not arguing that all theology is grounded first and foremost in the activity of worship, as do many contemporary liturgical theologians. Instead, he uses it as a way of arguing for the attunement of acts of worship and belief. The creed is intended not primarily for theological speculation, which is a necessary good, but for a real ascent to the Trinity. Real ascent has to do with the concrete, and therefore the worshiper ascends to this doctrine through contemplation of each of the propositions found within the creed in a spirit of adoration. Such ascent occurs through inflaming the religious imagination of the worshiper through contemplation of the scriptures, through the singing of hymns, and through participation in the liturgical rites for the major feasts of the year. The doctrine of the Trinity becomes real through worship, changing the very habit of mind of the worshiper. The creed relates to the salvation of men and women, shaping the way that they perceive the world. The separate articles of this creed are to become a space for thinking, for the development of specific affections, and habits of action that, although beginning in this world, continue the to the next. To refuse to proclaim this creed, no matter how seemingly complicated, would eventually lead to the attenuation of the religious imagination of believers as a whole, which Newman sees as evident within the broad church tradition. Thus, at the conclusion of the first part of an essay, Newman has defined the Lex Arandi as a habit of mind, oriented towards the exercise of the religious imagination that enables the human person to make a real ascent to God. Divine worship makes possible real ascent because it employs concrete images, moves the affections, presenting a personal rather than a personal God. If we had time and we were in person instead of distant from one another through digital uh, sort of uh, digital atoms permeating the cosmos, we could move further into this, but we're not going to. So a further analysis would show how Newman sees this activity as worship as making real the history proclaimed in the scriptures, how that's integral eventually to the alliterative sense. But it's enough for the current presentation to summarize the kind of psychagogy that Newman would seek to perform in the sermons. That is, Newman is interested in leading persons to a real ascent in God 
as mediated through the church's liturgical cycle. <clears throat> this process of leading one to a real ascent in God is not reducible in any of the sermons to a mere notional explanation of the nature of God. I cough once more. <clears throat> the personal quality of these sermons is necessary because he's performing a series of exercises whereby the modern English Christian finds a way beyond skepticism, religious apathy, or an emotional Christianity that each forego the necessary difficulty of learning to see God. The sermons don't just explain this God, they take up Newman's concern of a real ascent, making such ascent possible on the part of the listener and eventually the reader for, for whom these sermons were published. All right, part three, the liturgical sermons. The parochial and plain sermons, partially due to their size, are often treated as individual sermons separate from one another, right? Uh, my copy here, uh, this is your size, right? Um, excessive. Yet it's better to understand the various volumes of sermons as leading one in a series of spiritual exercises often ordered around the liturgy intended to cultivate a religious imagination in which God becomes the most real of reality through the activity of worship and the attunement of the, the worshiper to the proper uh, sort of orientation towards these worship. The first volume of these sermons can be understood as a kind of sta a statement of purpose, describing the kind of therapies necessary to perform in the England of, of Newman's day. The first sermon, Holiness Necessary for Future Blessedness, well known, establishes that liturgical practice is integral to proper belief and thus knowledge of God. In a famous passage, which many of us have heard, Newman writes, heaven then is not like this world. I will say what is much more like a church. For in a place of public worship, no language of the world is heard. There are no schemes brought forward for temporal objects, great or small, no information how to strengthen our worldly interest, extend our influence or establish our credit, these things indeed may be right in their way. Here we hear solely and entirely of God. We praise him, worship him, sing to him, thank him, confess to him, give ourselves up to him and ask his blessing. The Christian is therefore asked to perform an act of imagination. The seemingly impoverished or habitual language of the church's liturgy is not something merely to endure while awaiting the supposed delights of heaven. The outward acts of divine worship are precisely the way that the Christian attunes oneself to the heavenly delights. For Newman, this is more than a polemic against either a rational or subjectivist approach to religion. The sermons are indeed concerned with both things. In Religion of the Day, Newman presents the deficiencies of English Christianity as he sees it, that which is reluctant to engage in any particular religious practice that is considered too extreme, too superstitious. Likewise, he often turns against the assumption that religious emotion, as valued by the Moravians, uh, and then the Methodists, is evidence of supposed holiness. These polemics are concerns in the sermons, but as sermons, as psychological homilies, spiritual exercises grounded in the tradition of Nyssa and Augustine's preaching, Newman is practicing a psychagogy whereby the listener reader is led to know God through worship and through specific acts of exercising the memory, the understanding, and the will. One is constantly invited to reflect on these external acts of religion, understanding how they prepare one to bestow a full, absolute, real assent to the existence of God. Attention to these techniques, especially in the liturgical sermons, reveals the precise nature of these exercises. I will look at this psychagogy exclusively now, because of time, in Newman's Advent sermons, uh, linking up at the end a little bit to Christmas. Newman's cycle of sermons on Advent occur in volume five, published in, in 1840. Newman begins the first Advent sermon with a reflection on the precarity of life as the English countryside enters winter, performing a kind of exercise that many of us in the Midwest have done. 
The very frost and cold, he writes, rain and gloom, which now befall us, forebode the last dreary days of the world, and in religious hearts raise the thought of them. End quote. As the mind is turned toward the darkness of winter, there is nonetheless the hope that arises in the heart of not just the Christian, but all human beings. The hope for spring becomes an impetus for the Christian to long anew for the advent of the risen King and Lord. The cycle of the season stands in stark contrast to the historical narrative of Advent. Here, one encounters a frequent uh, rhetorical device in Newman. He contrasts the glories described in the scriptures, that is, the coming of Christ at the end of time, with the mundaneness of life within the church. Again, quoting Newman, one year goes and the, then another, but the same warnings recur. The frost or the rain comes again. The earth is stripped of its brightness. There is nothing to rejoice in. And then amid this profitableness of earth and sky, the well-known wor words return. Uh, and here he quotes from Isaiah. These well-known words exhort the Christian to await the coming of the bridegroom. And yet all that the Christian is given year after year are the same colics, the same readings, the same exact practices. Newman then enters into the formal thesis of this initial Advent sermon. And in the worship and service of Almighty God, he writes, which Christ and his apostles have left to us, we are vouchsafe means both moral and mystical of approaching God and gradually learning to bear the sight of him. The religious service is therefore not a separate task from going out to meet the bridegroom. Learning to perceive the advent of the Lord requires nothing more than participation in the church's worship. Newman, in fact, describes the concrete practices of worship that one should employ in Advent, including kneeling. He writes, when we kneel down in prayer in private, let us think to ourselves, thus shall I one day kneel down before his very footstool in this flesh and this blood of mine, and he will be seated over against me in flesh and blood also, though divine. I come with the thought of that awful hour before me. I come to confess my sin to him now that he may pardon it. And I say, O oh Lord, holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, deliver us, O oh Lord. Newman is linking in the mind of his listener reader the eschatological coming of the Lord, the act of kneeling so common, and a devotional prayer popular among Victorian Anglicans. Of course, this is taken from the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, but of course it was, uh, it was part of a devotional prayer that households would pray simultaneously uh, or, or pray concurrently that Newman was writing uh, around the coming of the Lord. The whole sacramental economy eventually in the sermon, as, New as Newman explores, is an opportunity to recollect the coming of Christ. Still, Newman's individual Advent sermons, like all the sermons, cannot be read as self-enclosed entities. The exercises they invite one to perform often link back again. They're more like platonic dialogues at times, beginning and ending. Uh, this is why, by the way, they're so hard to read straight through, uh, because you feel like uh, you're circling again and again in a kind of spiral over the same themes. And yet you are advancing. The dialogue continues in the sermons in the interrelationship between the various Advent sermons. Having established that the Christian through liturgical practice may recognize the presence of the coming Lord, Newman begins again with how difficult this task is to really perceive God. Most men for Newman are not interested in the difficult work of perceiving this presence. He describes two classes of persons who are especially deficient in this regard in essence, inviting the listener reader to assess whether in fact they belong to one of those classes. The first class is the proponent of the religion of the day, uninterested in the niceties of doctrine, such that everyone who has a certain uprightness, social uprightness primarily will be saved. The second class are sure of their salvation beyond all anxiety because the affections they've experienced. Both classes transgress the divine name, speaking with an uncomfortable degree of familiarity to God. 
In essence, Newman is performing a kind of public examination of conscience, asking each listener to assess if they belong to one of these classes. He heaps up examples in the sermon, with each example beginning with another instance of this. This creates a kind of distance between himself and the listener, so that they're able to perform this examination of conscience without Newman immediately condemning them. Each instance described surrounds a, a lack of fear toward God. Reverence, a necessary disposition for the Christian to develop in Advent, necessitates this fear. But this fear, as Newman proposes, is a form of knowledge, a spirit of adoration grounded in acts of faith. The kinds of practices Christians perform before God matters. Newman writes in the sermon, what you will ask are acts of faith, such as these to come often into prayer is an act of faith. To kneel down instead of sitting is an act of faith. To strive to attend to your prayers is an act of faith. To behave in God's house and otherwise than you would in a common room is an act of faith. To come to it on weekdays as well as on Sundays is an act of faith. To come often to the most holy sacrament is an act of faith. And to be still and reverent during that sacred service is an act of faith. These are all acts of faith because they are all such acts such as we should perform if we saw and heard him who is present though with our bodily eyes, we see and hear him not. The first and second sermons are ultimately about the same thing, but they lead the listener reader through a distinct process of self-examination. In essence, healing both the one possessing the religion of the day, as well as the one obsessed with self-examination and religious affection. The eschatological formation of Advent is nothing more remarkable than immersion into obediential practice. A third Advent sermon again deals with the difficulty of entering into practices that enable one to perceive the presence of God. Newman initially sets forth the heart of the Christian profession of faith. Through the incarnation of the word, the Christians have a new way of seeing what we call faith. And yet Newman notes his age is consistently interested in making public acts of profession, both political, what side do you stand on? Where do you belong in the church? But very often, as he'll note, not related to the creed. They want private judgment, even more preaching and teaching on acts that allow them to discern on their own. And in fact, certain acts of profession are considered necessary for social standing. He highlights what such acts are. There are those who profess faith, again, he does the same thing he did in the second sermon, of distancing himself from this so that the individual can make the assessment on his or her own. There are those who profess faith because of the gift of eloquence, those who do so because they're required to do so by their office. In essence, Newman is now turning the practice of Christian faith upon itself, demanding that the one who practices access the rationale for their practice. The rationale may be for the sake of social standing, but it doesn't need to be. Quoting Newman, aim at seeing things as God sees them. Aim at forging judgments about persons, events, ranks, fortunes, changes, objects such as God forms. Aims at looking at this life as God looks at it. Aim at looking at the things of life to come in the world unseen as God does. Aim at seeing the king and his beauty. All things that we see are but shadows to us and delusions unless we enter into what they really mean. And this is actually, he, Newman is prescribing concrete practices of meditation uh, that each day the Christian should aim to see the world in this way, to take up a different perspective of knowing. One must look exclusively to delight in God, not mere empty words, not religious curiousness for its own sake. There's a posture of humble reception, of delight in these practices that is required so that the Christian may learn to speak real rather than unreal words. The last Advent sermon begins with scriptural quotes, the hope of Israel waiting the coming of Christ. There's an equal mixture of comfort and fear. Newman introduces this as a kind of philosophical aporia that one must consider 
if we are to learn to await the coming of Christ. He writes, it was a seeming contradiction how good men were to desire his first coming, yet be unable to abide it. How the apostles feared, yet rejoiced after his resurrection. And so it is a paradox how the Christian should in all things be sorrowful, yet possessing all things. Such seeming contradictions arise from the want of depth in our minds to master the whole truth. We have not keen eyes to follow out the line of God's providence and will. Functionally, at the conclusion of Advent, one is not in a better state as a human being. You've not worked out your salvation. Human knowing is complicated and we're left with the precise same problems as Newman describes as Israel, the apostles, and every other Christian. We're incapable of immediately recognizing what has come before our eyes, fearful that such sight will be too much for us, for us. fearful further that the judgment will be excessive. And yet the judgment is coming. Newman invites his listener into a kind of practice of imagining one's judgment. Um, I note here, uh, which in, a, a late, in the version of this paper that we presented, that there's actually much in common with this section as Newman's later, the, the dream of Gerontius, where he invites us in essence to imagine a kind of poetic judgment. What would it mean to have the eyes of the all seeing one gaze upon us? Know every thought that we have. This question invites the listener reader, in fact, to engage in this process of judgment right now. We are to perform this act of self-examination, to imagine ourselves as being judged by the living God. But what are we to do about this? Because once you engage in this practice, it's rather dreadful. Newman concludes his last Advent sermon with practices whereby habits might be established that would allow for a fruitful judgment. The first dimension is to give up the project of surety of affection and instead take up obedience following the instruction of the scriptures and the ordinances of the sacraments. Second, we must give up this totalizing fear of judgment, casting hope in Christ alone. He writes, when we pray that he would come, we pray also that we may be ready, that all things may converge and meet in him, that he may draw us while he draws near us and make us holier the closer he comes. Third, the person still objects that they're unclean in an almost dialogical fashion. You, um, there's a kind of res uh, a resonance here to uh, uh, sort of the Holy Communion uh, three uh, poem that you find in George Herbert. Uh, Newman, in essence, reiterates that one must always recognize that one is a beginner relying on God alone. There is repentance, but there's the hope of a cleansing not accomplished by the self. Lastly, Advent forms one in a disposition of self-renunciation of total self-emptying, God alone will provide in the end. These Advent sermons end, and you hope that in Christmas you'll find the fulfillment. But what's shocking about Newman's Christmas sermons, and we're, we won't get into the fullness of them, but Newman's Christmas sermons, especially in volume five, is how little they attend immediately to consolation. One is left more with images of judgment, of further preparation for the coming of Christ into the world. Volume two's Christmas sermon, uh, of which there's one, is not entirely different from volume five. Volume two Christmas sermon begins with professing faith in the incarnation of the word made flesh, a profession made fruitful through a spirit of adoration, yet it ends with an image of judgment. Newman writes, he was given us to share his own spiritual nature, he from whom we have drawn the life's blood of our souls. He, our brother, will decide about his brethren. In that his second coming, may he in his grace and loving pity remember us, who is our only hope, our only salvation. Likely, Newman is not just being dour in his assessment of the incarnation. Many of the familial, often sentimental traditions surrounding Christmas came into existence during the Victorian era. Newman's Advent and Christmas sermons, as it turns out, are designed to counteract a kind of sentimental piety that too often marked Victorian England, uh, especially around death and dying and the Feast of Christmas. 
Christmas is a feast of joy, but that joy comes only with the ultimate judgment of the world, a judgment that is enshrined in the enfleshment of the word. Conclusion. This essay has taken us on a rather strange trajectory, moving us from patristic preaching as a form of psychagogy to the importance of liturgy and worship in Newman's uh, uh, kind of epistemology, his understanding of belief and knowledge, and now to the sermons, at least those of Advent. Uh, I, I regret that we did not do more, but it's really impossible to do more, as I'll argue in a moment. Here I conclude with consequences moving forward linked to the study of Newman's sermons, a contribution that Newman makes to liturgical theology, and what I'll call a response to secularity. Uh, so first, Newman's sermons. The tendency to read Newman's sermons out of order as pure examples of his theological thought often foregoes the subtle rhetorical journey he's taking his reader on. The Advent sermons cannot be easily summarized as a theology of Advent because each of the sermons rhetorically interact with one another. Likewise, they lead to the Christmas sermons, which also respond to the Advent sermons and point ahead towards Epiphany. There are specific rhetorical vice devices that do occur in these sermons again and again that one can isolate. There's the distance between visible practice and eschatology or seeing God. The use of scripture, the prominence of specific suggested practices. I would like to suggest that a, a study of Newman's sermons requires a more subtle attention to the interrelationship of the themes of the sermons and yes, careful, no. careful attention to the interrelationship of each sermon to the other the practices suggested, the acts of memory, understanding, and will around the scriptures that are described, and even the dialectical aspect of each sermon as it relates to other sermons. Two, liturgical theology and Newman. Newman's sermons ultimately present a far more sophisticated version of what is called liturgical theology than one often finds in present-day Catholicism and orthodoxy and in predict particular. Liturgy does not automatically communicate theological principles to the one praying. Instead, Newman is performing in a reflexive mode what it means to profess or, or to engage in alexorandi. The knowing that is accomplished is not immediate, but it's grounded in a spirit of adoration, of commitment to religious practice that leads to further knowledge of God. You could think of Newman as offering a kind of modern day mystagogy, not so much grounded in a kind of reflection on practices in which the worship was not immediately evident to the eyes in a kind of patristic mode, but that it wasn't immediately evident to the eyes because there was nothing immediately evident that was interesting about it. And it's actually that which enables one to enter into the spirit of this worship. Lastly, something about secularization theory and the sermons. In recent years, the theory of disenchantment and secularization has properly come under attack. Human beings still worship. They continue to find capital enchanting. They continue to find um, sort of social media enchanting. We all adore something. Uh, Apple is being sort of the great image, Apple computers. Happily, I'm speaking not on an Apple computer right now, but Apple computers as the ultimate image of this. Nonetheless, there's actually a more sophisticated way by which Newman's narrative allows us to understand what disenchantment consists of. While disenchantment may not be inevitable, as earlier sociologists argued, it nonetheless is a real experience. When God is not adored, when practice is not present, then the reality of God dissipates. Newman offers a medicine against disenchantment that is not described immediately by Charles Taylor. Uh, it's not a sheer movement toward poetics, but a kind of practice that infuses the imagination. It is committed to specific practices that takes uh, God as deadly serious as the one to which one owes obedience. And through this act of obedience, one begins to see in the world. And of course, if we had infinite time, which we don't, we could show how this actually is performed in 
all of Newman's sermons, uh, often as he takes up images of the saints, of the resurrection, providing ways that one comes to see God, uh, to believe God, to know God through the liturgy of the church. That is the presentation, and I thank you for your attention and time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Tim. That was wonderful. Gave us uh, a ton to reflect on. At this point, um, uh, we'd like to open the floor to questions. And I think the best way to do this is if you look at your dashboard at the bottom, uh, there's a chat uh, feature that you can toggle. And so go ahead and click on that and uh, uh, give me your name and maybe your institution if you'd like. And then I'll individually um, unmute the, uh, the person who's asking the question. Um, and I'll probably be uh, a little meaner than a debate host that you see in these political debates and uh, what, you know, take a decent amount of time for your question, but then we'll turn the floor back over to Tim to give an answer. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, Mariel Corona. Let me see if I can, um, here we go. So unmute her and. Oh, hi. Hey. <laughs> Well, but if you want to read it, maybe that's clear with my accent and... Okay. I think your accent is lovely. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, well oh, so thank you. I can explain. Uh, it seemed to me that you said that Newman's sermons foster a communal understanding of salvation. Uh, but I understand that his idea of real ascent is very, very personal. No one can do it for you. So can you comment between this communal understanding of salvation or belief or knowledge and real ascent as personal just seem a bit contradictory. Sure. Yeah, I mean, so no one can do it for you, but the only way that one does it, of course, in, uh, this, in the sermons is through that which has been bestowed by the church, the particular ordinances, the forms of life that have been bestowed to the church, the scriptures that have been handed on by the church, and so there's no escaping that this act of real ascent is taking place within this kind of communal dimension. So it is personal. And I think that is perceived in the sermons and that each person has to undertake these exercises. And yet it's not private, right? So it's not undertaken um, as a sheer individual activity by oneself, uh, uh, entirely apart from uh, that which has been handed over to one. And so it is personal but it's not private. Does that make sense? Sorry, uh, completely. The, I, like that distinction between personal and private done within a tradition, I, it does help me. Thank you. Uh, someone else, are there other questions from uh, out in the, the universe, wherever you are? <laughs> Uh, Tim, something came to mind for me. Um, Mark McEnroy has done some really fascinating research on the concept of theosis and deification. And he actually argues that uh, Newman was resourcing that idea from the fathers before, you know, of course, in the 20th century, um, theosis really came back into uh, the West in a prominent manner. Uh, when I was hearing you talk about, I'm probably going to mispronounce it, Saika Goji, uh, and this sort of like performative way of drawing us into or drawing us closer to God. Um, I, could you offer any comment as to like maybe the connection between the rhetoric that Newman's using in his preaching and, and even his uh, soteriology? Yes. So, uh, yeah, I do see a connection between uh, both theosis and psychagogy. Um, psychagogy um, was employed... Um, the recent sort of analysis of Augustine's preaching, for example, notes, uh, you know, you've, there's many people who quote uh, Sermon 272 around the Eucharist, which is become what you receive, receive what you are, uh, and th that this is often understood purely in a kind of ecclesiological mode, right? So become the church, become Christ's body. But in fact, this language of becoming is evident throughout uh, Augustine's preaching. So you often find Augustine saying, become this light, um, become this harp. Uh, one of Augustine's sermons on um, praise, for example, notes that, you know, to become the choir of singers, the, the choirs of saints, 
you're going to have to become like an instrument. And he invites each person in the assembly to imagine themselves as a, as a member of one of these kind of instruments. So this psychagogy is, I think, closely linked to the manner by which one appropriates within oneself, um, and, and of course, within a broader, the church, um, how one incorporates the scriptural narrative into one's memory, imagination, and will. And so psychagogy in, in a Gassidian sense is, is, is linked to this. And so, so for Newman, um, there is a kind of becoming that's necessary through the contemplation of the images of the scripture, to taking them up, um, to performing them, and the formation of this kind of imagination. And so I, I do see a, a link between it. Uh, you could kind of think about psychagogy as a rhetorical device and performance that actually one uh, allows one to pursue this kind of soteriology or this pursuit of holiness specifically through taking up the images and practices demanded upon the feasts of the church that one might actually sort of live them out and perceive the world according to these feasts and practices. Okay, uh, uh, Nina, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not gonna be able to finish tackling the question. Before the, um, the previous question finished. So, uh, but um, Professor O'Malley, uh, you had commented. Are you able to hear me, by the way? I can kind of hear you. Every like four seconds is a fade out. All right, here we go. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, you had mentioned, and this, this was. Um, uh, this question was kind of in my head when I read the description of your keynote lecture, and you had mentioned it just a few moments ago in answering the other question regarding memory, imagination, and will. Um, and I'm about to tell you everything I know about Thomism, so which is, which is, which is very little. Uh, can you comment uh, how Newman regarded those elements? Because of course, that's from what I understand uh, about Thomism, which as I said, is very little, that the parts of our soul being the memory and imagination, again, as I understand those, are the lower parts, and our will and our intellect constitute the higher parts. Um, and, and, and in hearing you answer the previous question, you, you spoke about memory, imagination, and will as though, well, you kind of used them in one phrase, I guess I would say. Uh, yes. My understanding is that those, they're, they're really quite distinct, as I said, the, the memory and the imagination being the lower parts of our souls, as I understand uh, Aquinas, and the intellect and the will are the higher parts. And so I guess, could you comment a little bit, maybe, um, firstly, when you, when you mentioned all three of those at once, to me it makes it kind of sound like, are they meant to be the same thing? Uh, I guess that's my first question, um, because again, my understanding from Aquinas is that they're not. And then secondly, could you comment a little bit about um, maybe how Newman regarded those elements as well? Because um, again, as I understand it, imagination is not considered uh, the human peak. The peak of humanity would be our intellects and our wills and memory and imagination are things that um, are easily manipulated. So I'm not drawing on Thomas. And uh, so I, I should sort of articulate that from the very beginning. I'm drawing from Augustine, who is not Thomas. And despite what Thomas sometimes do, he wasn't Thomas before Thomas. Um, and so uh, Augustine employs those terms not in the way that Thomas does. And um, so, so in, in that sense, I'm, I'm employing them within psychological traditions of memory, understanding, and will. And if I misspoke, my apologies, um, which includes the sort of intellectuals. Um, memory uh, being the manner by which images are implanted, the, the, the sort of meta, the, the techniques of meditation by which understanding is performed and the manner in which uh, that dimension then infuses or, 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 or is concerned with human activity. Most of the time in Augustinian thought, memory, understanding, and will comes to be treated as sheerly Trinitarian. Augustine had no particular interest, actually, as it turns out, in those fundamentally as Trinitarian because he destroys them so quickly in De Trinitate. So while those are often, I mean, he had interest in them, but uh, as a sort of uh, 
uh, image of the Trinity, but was far more uh, memory, understanding, and will were often employed in the rhetorical traditions as necessary for the speaking of rhetoric, right? So every rhetorician would need to have um, a storehouse of images they would employ. Understanding was that technique of meditation, but there was also the exhortation to action in, uh, that was employed. And so uh, I often, uh, I don't fight with Thomas. I have no desire to fight with Thomas. Um, but to, simply to note that in the patristic era, I, I don't think you can necessarily read everything that's patristic um, through the lens of Thomas. And so uh, certainly relative to like the soul and what's the higher and lower dimensions of the soul is, is less of interest than as a rhetorical technique. Does that make sense? I imagine you're silent now. By, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't, wasn't sure how to unmute. Yeah, it does. Um, you, you <clears throat> excuse me, the network or the bandwidth um, kind of blanked out slightly a little bit at, at the beginning of your, uh, of your answer, but I think I got it. Um, so it's really mainly, okay. And then of course you did say earlier in the lecture that, that this was through the kind of through the lens of Augustine. Well, not just Augustine, but like the patristic era. So it is taken right. up in the figures that are not Thomas. This is taken up in medieval rhetoric as well. Um, you find it in Bernard of Clairvaux. It's certainly uh, prominent within the Latin tradition. Uh, and uh, although I know, uh, of course, you know, uh, Newman is drawing a good deal on the Greeks as well. Um, it's prominent within the Latin tradition before Thomas. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. All right, we maybe have time for one more. Is there anyone else who would like to jump in at this point? 